Hey there, this is Dr. Claw with an explanation of the close reading assignment. And this explanation will cover not only steps one through four, but also steps five through seven. So first you're going to want to navigate to the assignment in Canvas. You can locate that in the assignments area by clicking on the link here. Um, and you'll see on the instructions here that one of the first things you want to do is download the blank close reading assignment and save it somewhere you can find it because you are going to work in this blank document. Um, you'll leave all the questions and prompts there and turn it in with your answers on it. So I don't want a blank piece of paper from you with your answers on it. I want to see your answers with the questions and the steps and the prompts and all that. Um, then I'm asking you to read the sample close reading down here, um, and I'm about to walk you through that very closely. And then you'll choose a passage from Beowulf, no fewer than four lines and no more than ten lines, and include in your document that you submit to me the Babel page numbers and line numbers so that I can actually find the passage that you're talking about. And then um, for the first half of the assignment, you'll complete steps one through four and submit them to Canvas. Uh, with the complete document, you can just leave steps five through seven blank. And then we'll talk a little bit about what you have found in doing those first four steps before you embark on steps five through seven. Okay, so let's have a look at the, um, the sample that I have created for Beowulf. So as you'll see, and as you can probably tell from the title, the goal of this assignment is for you to create a close reading. Close reading is something that we do in literary analysis to help us engage very closely with the text and to read it on multiple levels. And this assignment is going to walk you through how to do that. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna really go through each step in this assignment, but as you progress through the class, you'll find that um, you don't necessarily have to write out every single step in order to conduct a close reading. You'll, some of it will start to become uh, more habitual for you. Okay, so um, first things first, you got to choose a passage. I have chosen something towards the end of Beowulf here, and um, my passage is six lines long. You don't want to go a whole lot longer than that or a whole lot shorter than that um, because you're trying to find something that you can conduct a simple close reading of, not write a paper on. Um, but you also don't want it to be um, so long that you don't have enough time to look closely at it. All right, so my passage is, and they buried torques in the barrow and jewels and a trove of such things as trespassing men had once dared to drag from the hoard. They let the ground keep that ancestral treasure, gold under gravel, gone to earth, as useless to men now as it ever was. All right, so the first thing that we do when we are trying to analyze the text is determine the literal meaning. So what does it say, not what does it mean, what does it say? Step one should contain no analysis. Think of it as a, a kind of translation into plain English. So um, especially when you're working with poetry, you might need to figure out, well, what is it actually saying and talking about here? You know, the who, what, when, where kind of thing. Um, so I found that this passage in Beowulf says that people buried necklaces, jewels, and other treasures in the barrow or grave. So you can see this is also a moment where if there are some strange words in there that maybe aren't the types of words you would use, you could translate them. So I don't usually walk around talking about barrows. The word grave is much more the type of word that I would use. So I put that in there to remind me this is what we're talking about. Um, the treasure stays underground. It's covered by earth and is useless to men. And then treasure has always been this useless to men. That, that last line seemed pretty emphatic to me, so I just wanted to reiterate that um, this is a part of the passage. So once you've determined the literal meaning, then um, think about what in that passage seems interesting, noteworthy, or just jumped out at you. This could be something that is exciting to you, but it could be something that is confusing or frustrating or annoying. Anything that drew your attention is what you want to talk about in step two, and you don't need to narrow it down in step two. Um, you're just th kind of throwing it all out there, and then later you can narrow it down. So for me, I noticed that this passage depicting Beowulf's memorial mound had a lot of images of dirt and earth and also images of treasure. And both of those things jumped out at me, so I put them both here in step two. 
Um, now in step three, I'm going to flesh out what I noticed. So I'll work one by one on the things that I noticed. So if you only noticed one thing, then you're just going to be fleshing out that one thing. If you noticed three things, then you're going to flesh out all three of those things. Because again, we're not at the narrowing down point yet. All right, so um, when I was looking at the Earth imagery, there was so much going on that I tried to find a way to classify it. And so I ended up going by parts of speech, um, verbs, nouns, and prepositions. You are not required to go by parts of speech. You might find some other way to classify it. You might say like, oh, I found a lot of water imagery or... Um, I found a lot of metaphors in mine, or I found a lot of similes in mine. Uh, whatever you find is fine, um, but step three is the point where you classify. I should see some actual words from the passage. So this is where you're going to have quotations from the text. This is an evidence step. Um, in order to get full credit for this step, you do need words taken directly from the passage. Um, so you can either put them in a separate spot like I did, so I, I separated it out from my own words, um, or you can put quotation marks around them as you are talking through them, but you have to have words from the passage. So see, buried, buried, drag from, drag from, that sort of thing. So again, step three is evidence, and um, just sort of picking out the evidence and classifying it to try to understand what it is that you've been noticing. Okay, um, and then I had a little preliminary analysis of, of the evidence that I found. Based on the volume of words referring to the earth and referring to ground, combined with the references to graves, so like barrow, burial, and the underground, this passage seems very interested in burials and bodies being returned to the earth. Um, but that wasn't the only thing I noticed. And you can see I go through the same process with the treasure imagery. And I expected that with the treasure imagery, I was going to have a nice variety again, uh, verbs, nouns, prepositions. But I was surprised to find that all I had were nouns. So again, when you run into something that is surprising or not what you expected, that's often a sign that um, that is a useful moment to analyze and to think more closely about um, which is what I end up doing in step four. So I notice that not only are there fewer treasure words than burial words, and that's very easy to see because I did type out my evidence. So you can see there's just these for treasure, whereas there's all of these for burial. Um, so I noticed more burial stuff than treasure stuff, but also I found it significant that there was such a difference in the types of words. So treasure was only nouns, whereas um, with the burial we had verbs, nouns, and prepositions. So that that dif difference in what I was expecting and what was, that prompted me to start saying, okay, I think I'm going to analyze what is this relationship between um, what I noticed and uh, these different parts of the text. And that's what happens in step four. You start analyzing. And I'm going to go through this um, and read it verbatim because this is a step-by-step -step explanation of my logic. This is uh, your preliminary, I'm trying to figure out what it is I'm noticing in this passage. So it is important to really spell out your logic, um, both for you and for your reader. So first I notice most of the words are about burial, but then the repetition of both burial words and treasure words associates the two together. So this passage isn't just about burial, and it's not just about treasure. It repeats both of these words, which tells me there's a relationship between burial and treasure. Because there seems there are more burial words than treasure words, the treasure seems subordinate to burial, as if burial is more important than treasure. All of the treasure words are nouns, which are things rather than actions. And the final line of the passage indicates that treasure is as useless to men now as it ever was. So all I've done here in step four is analyze the relationship between um, the things that I noticed and uh, just the things that I noticed. In step five, that's when I start comparing the relationship between the things that I noticed. So basically step four and the content. 
So you can think of step five as a combination or a comparison between step four and step one. So is the stuff that I noticed about the relationship um, between the things I noticed, is that reinforcing the content? So that kind of literal um, plain English translation that I made, or is it contradicting that in some way? So step five is an essential step to getting to the kind of so what and the big idea picture um, is understanding as you look deeper at the text, does it reveal like, yes, it's reinforcing the same thing that it seemed to say on the surface, or is it kind of contradicting that or undermining uh, what it originally seemed to say? All right, so step six is when you start to connect that one passage, because steps one through five have all been just about that passage. I don't want to see anything about stuff uh, beyond that passage in steps one through five. At step six, that's when you connect your passage to the larger context of the text. And my box here, I think, gives a good explanation of what that kind of means. So how the comparative relationship I found in step five connects to other parts of the text. So for me, how does this passage about burial and treasure connect to other parts of the text of Beowulf? Well, I discovered that this passage is important to Beowulf as a whole because throughout the text, the lords are frequently described as a treasure giver or a ring giver, um, and the whole society of the Danes and Geats t uh, seems to depend on the give and take of the lord and his retainers, where the lord gives treasure and the retainers defend the lord. But now I'm finding a problem because my passage has indicated that treasure is useless. So if treasure is useless, like the passage I looked at suggests, then the society is structured on something useless. And that's kind of surprising. So now we're starting to get into um, a, a kind of big claim that this passage has led us to, a big claim about Beowulf as a whole. And so step six then allows you to have the materials you need to identify the big picture and make a claim using the claim formula. So how does that big picture that we discovered in step six help us understand the text as a whole? So the narrator's description of Beowulf's funeral mound with its focus on burial and treasure questions whether Beowulf ha and any of the members of the society actually accomplished anything useful throughout the text. This bleak observation is reinforced by the woman's lament at the end of the text that predicts the war and destruction about to be wreaked upon the Geats now that their lord is dead and cannot defend them. The treasure does nothing to keep them from dying. So now I want to convert this into a claim formula and I'll talk more about the claim formula um, in class and on Yellow Dig. Um, so I'm not going to go into that right now, but you do need an actual claim, a close reading claim here at the bottom using the claim formula. So mine, my what the text is doing is the subordination of treasure to burial in this passage. So notice that's something that I had noticed way up here um, in step four. So you're going to pull from multiple parts of your work as you make your final claim. So that's what the text is doing. It subordinates treasure to burial. And then how does that subordination of treasure to burial affect the way I understand the text? Well, uh, to me, that subordination of treasure to burial suggests that the character's focus on treasure in the larger context of Beowulf is foolish. And that foolishness then undercuts the heroic overtones of the story. So here I've concluded my close reading with recognizing that this passage has changed the way I think about the whole text because it demonstrated that treasure is a little silly and, and useless and foolish. But then I remembered that um, that's sort of how lords define themselves is by giving treasure. So if all of this society is based on a foolish thing, then how can this really be a heroic story? So that is an example of how you conduct a close reading using the close reading assignment.